Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. The Colonial Pipeline is still down after being hit with a cyber attack. We bring you the latest from Washington, D.C. Gas stations in several southern states are facing shortages. The governor, Georgia governor, is suspending state gas taxes in response. Five Republican governors are pulling out of federal unemployment benefits. They say the relief was meant to be short term and it keeps people from getting back to work. An independent news outlet in Hong Kong says Beijing's grip is tightening. In just a month, the paper and one of its reporters both suffered attacks. They suspect the Chinese communist regime is behind it. Some COVID patients in India contract rare fungal infection. Health officials say over 2,000 cases reported. A few days from the crippling cyber attack on a major U.S. pipeline, and Americans are starting to feel the effects. The energy secretary today trying to allay fears about what might be yet to come. The recent cyber attack that paralyzed a major U.S. pipeline is creating a frenzy of panic buying across the East Coast. In many areas, gas stations have already run out of gas, like this one in South Carolina. The QT gas station on Selenese around 9.30 at night, they are out of gas. Gas prices were already on the rise prior to the cyber attack. Prices rose 60% over the past year alone. With what's just happened, it could make things much, much worse. Biden's Energy Secretary Jennifer Grandholm tried to ease fears of looming price hikes and fuel shortages. Let me just be really clear. The crunch is in the areas that are affected by the pipeline, the main spurs of the pipeline. So that really is the southeast. It's about 70 percent of the supplies of North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, and uh, especially southern Virginia are impacted the most. The impacts of the cyber attack are still unfolding, but some people we spoke to are afraid of what is yet to come. It's terrifying. Um, My family owns a business. We have five locations across the DMV. Uh, I drive all over the city doing deliveries, going between my stores. Today I was at three different locations. Used more than a quarter of a tank of gas, which is going to cost me $25, $30. It's quite scary, but I hope it's not going to last long. Dick Patton, president of America Business Defense Council, says this is an opportunity to reassess America's energy policies. We're down to too few pipelines. And unfortunately, right now, our government is taking pipelines that were being built and stopping those so that we don't even have backups. Patton also said there are national security implications. We have less diversity, less security. It it affects our our, our ability to militarily defend our nation because we need it for that. But we need it for our lives and our freedom and our family. As for where we stand now and where things are going, we asked David Kreutzer from the Institute of Energy Research. Well, the, 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 the pipeline owner said they hope to have it back online by the end of this week. Uh, so it, it should, if that's true, settle out uh, you know, pretty shortly after that. From the people that we've talked to here in Washington, D.C., it's obvious that the situation is very concerning. Steve Lance, NTD News, Washington, D.C. Georgians don't have to pay state gas taxes starting from today to this Saturday at least. Georgia's governor is suspending the tax and doing away with many restrictions on trucks transporting fuel. NTD's Allison Lee has the details. Georgia Governor Brian Kemp is taking executive action. He's declaring a state of emergency in response to gas shortages caused by the attack on Colonial Pipeline. The order also will suspend the collection of state taxes on diesel and motor fuel through Saturday night. Again, we are hopeful that this issue is short-lived, and I'm happy to provide some relief to Georgians who are going to see higher prices this week. Kemp's executive order on Tuesday increases weight and size limits for trucks transporting gasoline, suspends hour limits for commercial vehicles, and bans price gouging. He has the right to renew this order depending on the pipeline situation. The governor says we do not want to make clear that anyone taking advantage of this disruption and making a quick buck off the backs of Georgians will not be tolerated. 
According to gas price analyst Patrick Dehan, a number of gas stations in at least six southern states are currently out of gas. Over 7 percent of Virginia's gas stations are out of gas. In North Carolina, it's over 6 percent, and in Georgia, over 4 percent. People in parts of Florida and South Carolina are also seeing bags covering pumps at some gas stations. Meanwhile, North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper declared a state of emergency in his state on Monday, as Colonial Pipeline is a primary fuel pipeline in the state. To deal with the shortage, he is also suspending some weight and size limits for trucks carrying fuels, and they're expected to remain in effect for at least 30 days. Allison Lee, NTD News. And it looks like Georgians could do with some relief. They've been stocking up on gas and for a hefty price. NTD's Arian Pazdar has the story. We spoke with some people at a gas station in Atlanta on Tuesday. I just paid $30 for eight gallons of gas. Pretty expensive. <laughs> but she had her reasons for paying that price. Well, right by my house is at a gas, so off of Windward Parkway. There's no gas over there. There's no gas at Kroger. And so I called them and he said he had gas. Latrice wasn't the only person in that area looking for gas. I went to another gas station over near Kroger and they were already all out. And she said it was really busy at the one at the top of Sargent Road. So I just kept going until I found a spot. <laughs> Yet another person was traveling all the way from South Dakota for her niece's graduation. I need to get back. Um, and right now I need to go to, when I leave here, I'm going to Richmond. Um, and my husband told me I would need to fill up at least once on my way back. Now I'm a little concerned because I don't know if I'll be able to even do that. Kelly said she thinks she made the right decision by filling up her tank as soon as possible. Glad that we did because it's kind of nuts that people are already this soon because maybe they're gonna run out of gas before they can fill up. Yet for some Georgians, it's still life as usual. One driver told us he just doesn't want his tank to go into reserve mode. Not everyone is filling up because of the shortage. Arian Pastar, NTD News. Earlier, the Biden administration approved the first major offshore wind project. They expect it will create nearly 4,000 jobs and bring power to nearly half a million homes and businesses. But critics say it's a risky business since it's a multi-billion dollar investment and little is known about the efficiency of the large windmills. Tuesday's decision gives Vineyard Wind federal approval to install up to 84 turbines off of two Massachusetts islands, Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. It'll be the third offshore wind project in the U.S. and the largest. On top of this, the Biden administration is reviewing two other offshore wind projects in New York. And have the extended unemployment benefits encouraged people to stay home rather than go back to work? Some Republican senators say this is the case, but some Democrats blame companies for not paying workers enough. NTD's Melina Wisecup has more. President Biden regularly touts his pandemic response. Nearly 40 percent of Americans have been fully vaccinated, but it doesn't look like these vaccinations are encouraging folks to get back to work. The latest jobs report shows that just 266,000 went back to work in April. That's less than half of the one million people estimated to get back on the job. Some Republican senators say the extended unemployment benefits are to blame for the slow recovery. That's true. I spoke to literally thousands of people over the past 10 days. The number one concern employers have is a lack of people for the jobs. And every one of them tells me that they're getting paid more to stay home than to come back to work. Business owners across the nation are struggling to hire workers. Job openings hit a pandemic record high in March at 8.1 million. But people just aren't filling those slots. A New York City restaurant owner told the Epoch Times they are 60 employees short and that he hasn't reopened one of his restaurants yet because they just don't have the manpower. But Biden insists that this is the business owner's problem and they should raise wages to bring people back. We also need to recognize that people will come back to work if they are paid a decent wage. But Republicans say businesses simply cannot compete with the federal government's unemployment benefits. Biden's $1.9 trillion stimulus plan extended the weekly $300 unemployment payments through September 6th. There's no uncertainty on how that is disincentivizing people coming back to work. Suggesting that the key to getting folks back to work is to lessen people's dependence on government benefits. 
On Monday, Biden said that anyone collecting unemployment who is offered a suitable job must take the job or lose their unemployment benefits. Melina Weisskopf, NTD News. On the other hand, some governors are ending unemployment benefits. This comes amid concerns that the benefits are leading to a shortage of people looking for work. NTD's Christina Kim reports. Alabama's Governor Kay Ivey joined a growing list of Republican governors to end the federal $300 unemployment boost during the pandemic. The federal support is in addition to state benefits. It was set to last until September. But starting June 19th, Alabama won't participate. Governor Ivey says Alabama's unemployment rate is 3.8 percent, the lowest in the southeast and significantly lower than the national rate. She says it's time to get back to work, and what was meant to be short-term relief is adding to a labor shortage. Arkansas, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, and South Carolina agree. Mississippi and Missouri are set to drop out the earliest on June 12th. South Carolina's governor is ending these programs beginning June 30th. He said these unemployment benefits are placing the United States on the road to socialism. He told Fox News' Tucker Carlson, getting back to work is how you build an economy, build a family, and everything else. We're not going to take that unemployment money to pay people for not working. we got help wanted signs up everywhere. We get calls and letters and texts from people uh, from all sorts of businesses all across the state. They're looking for people to work, and the people just won't come to work. It's a similar situation in Arkansas. The governor said these benefits were helpful at the height of the pandemic when unemployment rates were astronomical. But now the situation is different. He'll be pulling out of the benefits on June 26th. Montana will be dropping out of the program on June 27th for the same reason. But U.S. Labor Secretary Marty Walsh criticized the move from Montana. He said choosing to eliminate these critical benefits will have the greatest impact on the most vulnerable. He says this will force families to choose between their health and their economic security. Christina Kim, NTD News. A federal judge in Texas has dismissed the National Rifle Association's bankruptcy case. This leaves the gun rights advocacy group to face a lawsuit from the state of New York. The lawsuit accuses the NRA of financial abuses and is attempting to put the group out of business. The bankruptcy case is over whether the NRA can incorporate in Texas instead of New York. The judge said he was dismissing the case because the bankruptcy was not filed in good faith. He said the court views the NRA's case as a way to get out of litigation instead of it having trouble paying off its debts. If the NRA were able to file for bankruptcy, that may have helped it to reincorporate. And undocumented and international students are now eligible for federal pandemic relief grants. Education Secretary Miguel Cardona today lifted a Trump-era ban. It allows all college students access to the $36 billion pandemic aid. With a new rule, colleges can distribute pandemic relief grants to all students, regardless of their immigration status or whether they qualify for federal student aid. The grants help to pay for expenses like food, rent or transportation. The pandemic didn't discriminate against students, Secretary Cardona said in a briefing. He considers all students to be eligible, including non-citizens. This reversal of the Trump-era ban draws anger from Representative Virginia Fox, the top Republican on the House Education and Labor Committee. Fox said in a statement, Secretary Cardona's decision to give free money to illegal immigrants and foreign students is an insult to every American. President Biden is fueling an immigration crisis, and this final rule exacerbates the emergency at the southern border. Previously, former Education Secretary Betsy DeVos asserted that only federal student aid program participants can get the money. DeVos said that a provision in the federal 1996 welfare reform law prohibits non-citizens from receiving federal aid. Lin Lin, NTD News. Also today, 20 governors submit a joint letter to Biden. They say they don't have the resources to solve the federal government's southern border crisis and that it's not their responsibility. They call Biden's plan to house illegal immigrants unacceptable and unsustainable. And Florida is planning to offer more school choice. Governor Ron DeSantis just signed into law a $200 million plan meant to help families pay for education expenses. Uh, there's going to be more opportunities for more students and more families throughout the state of Florida as a result of this legislation. You know, we're not standing pat. We're on offense. When it comes to providing opportunity, we're on offense. 
It will go into effect starting in July and it'll pave the way for around 61,000 families to pay for private tuition and other expenses. DeSantis says the bill's priority will be low-income families, but it will be far-reaching. Under this new law, families have more flexibility to choose how to spend their vouchers. It can go towards tutoring and other additional spence, expenses like technology on top of private school tuition. The governor says it'll also decrease wait lists for scholarship programs and empower military families to maximize school choice. And India is reporting thousands of cases of a rare and deadly fungal infection. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on that and a doctor's take on why COVID patients are contracting this disease. You could call it adding insult to injury. India, already suffering from a terrible wave of COVID-19 infections, is now reporting disease of a different kind. Just a word of caution, here's a graphic image that could disturb you. This potentially deadly fungal disease is called mucormycosis, often called black fungus. According to Asian News International, or ANI, Maharashtra's health minister Rajesh Topi says over 2,000 people have contracted the disease, at least eight have died. A doctor from Gujarat told the Indian Express that 99% of his patients infected with mucormycosis had COVID. Black fungus is a rare disease, and the CDC says it's been shown to have a more than 50% death rate. In my career of 20 years as being a physician, I've probably seen this twice. Dr. Roger Schult, a MedCram instructor, tells me the fungus that causes this is everywhere. Why are COVID patients in India contracting this fungal infection while they're sick and even after they've recovered? Well, this infection is a fungal infection that likes to invade, go into the tissue, and goes to where its resources are, which is in the blood vessels. This fungus is known as mucormycosis. It lives in the soil. It lives, um, it is all over the place. You can't avoid it. And in fact, in some people, it actually lives in the mucosal layer of their sinuses. But there's an interplay there where the immune system is able to keep it at bay and keep it suppressed. He says high dose steroids sometimes given to COVID patients could be driving up these infections. We are treating patients with very high dose steroids. High dose steroids are well known to increase blood sugars and also well known to suppress the immune system. And those are the two major ingredients for mucor to invade the tissue and the blood system. ANI reports that Maharashtra's health minister is making special wards for these patients. Topi also says that the state will pay for their treatment. India has reported around 4,000 COVID deaths every day for nearly a week. They're still reporting over 300,000 COVID cases daily, but over the past three days, that daily number has been falling. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. Beijing appears to be tightening its grip on Hong Kong's press freedoms as acts of violence against independent media outlets in the city increase. NTD's Juliet Song has more. The U.S. State Department is condemning an attack against an Epoch Times reporter in Hong Kong. The Epoch Times newspaper is a multi-language news outlet operating around the globe. It's banned in mainland China but has a branch in Hong Kong. In an email, the State Department wrote, attacks against journalists are unacceptable and cannot be tolerated. It also urged authorities to complete a full investigation into the incident. Reporter Sarah Leung works for the paper's Hong Kong branch. On Tuesday, a man wielding a softball hit Leung more than 10 times outside her apartment building before fleeing the area. The attack left bruises on both of her legs. The director of Hong Kong Epoch Times says Liang is now in recovery. The doctor said she was badly beaten. Luckily, her bones weren't injured, and Liang is now receiving medical treatment. Guo says she thinks the Chinese regime is behind the attack. She adds that the attack isn't a standalone incident. Hong Kong Epoch Times has recently suffered a series of violent attacks. Just last month, four men broke into the paper's printing facility, damaging machines and computers there. The facility has also endured four similar attacks in recent years. Guo points out that a pro-Beijing newspaper also launched a smear campaign against the publication. Also, unidentified men followed our reporters and spied on us outside our printing press. 
Our employees' family members in China were also threatened. It's not a standalone incident, but a combination of threats, stalking and smear campaigns. She says the paper is attacked because it's one of just a few independent news outlets in the city. The paper's Hong Kong edition is known for its uncensored China coverage, often highlighting reports of the Chinese Communist regime's corruption and human rights abuse. And under the current difficult circumstances, people really hope to see truthful reporting from the Epic Times, and the Chinese regime is afraid to let people know the truth. And it's not just the Epoch Times. The Chinese regime appears to be tightening its leash on the city's price freedom. Last month, authorities sentenced activist Jimmy Lai to 14 months in prison. Lai is an outspoken critic of Beijing and the founder of a pro-democracy newspaper. Guo says Epoch Times employees in Hong Kong are under mounting pressure. It's media professionals' mission to report on what's happening locally. It's what they should do. And if Hong Kong loses freedom of speech, then Hong Kong would completely lose its value. The lives of the people of Hong Kong will also get more difficult. So if truthful reporting can deliver their voice, it's protection for the people there. She says that's why, even though the pressure is huge, they're not willing to give up. Juliet Son, NTD News. In response to the physical attack on the Epoch Times Hong Kong reporter, U.S. senators issued statements and calls to hold the Chinese communist operatives accountable. U.S. Senator Rick Scott said in a statement, reports of attacks on free press are extremely concerning. Now more than ever, the United States must stand up for democracy and human rights and fight against communist China's aggression and quest for global dominance. Congressman Greg Stubbe also condemns the attack, saying this attack is likely yet another egregious example of the Chinese Communist Party using violence to silence their critics in Hong Kong. The Chinese communist operatives responsible for this attack need to be held accountable. He also condemned how commended how despite having their printing press destroyed and their journalists targeted, the Epoch Times had never backed down from speaking the truth about the horrors of the CCP, and he applauded them for their bravery. And coming up, people nationwide make an early start in celebrating Falun Dafa Day. They give testimony on how they changed for the better after taking up the practice. And to combat the homelessness crisis in California, Governor Gavin Newsom proposes massive investment to help with housing. Various parts of the U.S. are kick-starting celebrations for World Falun Dafa Day. Practitioners held demonstrations of the Falun Dafa meditation practice, and some of them played live music. NTD's Don Tran has the details. From the streets of New York to the beaches of Florida, people across the country came together to celebrate World Falun Dafa Day. Rows upon rows of Falun Dafa practitioners demonstrated the five exercises, followed by live performances of classical Chinese music. The event marks a chance for practitioners to celebrate when Falun Dafa first came to the public. For me, it's uh, very important uh, what keep me positive, what keep me uh, in peace, what give me beauty of this. And a lot of wonderful events happened in my life after I started to practice it. And I'm very, very happy to be here and celebrate it and share it with everybody. Falun Dafa, also called Falun Gong, is a peaceful meditation practice based on the principles of truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. It was first taught publicly by Mr. Li Hangzhi in 1992 in China, and more than 100 million people were practicing by 1999. Many event attendees said the practice has benefited them in different ways. Practicing Falun Dafa helped me with my moral teachings uh, by really letting me for one, practice more of my compassion. So before I used to, you know, argue a lot more than I do now. So now I like think of other people's first before I do myself. I feel as if I can express that easier. Like um, sometimes when you're around certain people, it's hard to stay true to yourself. But now I'm able to like really stand firm in my beliefs and make sure that like I set my boundaries and maintain those boundaries no matter what. 
I think it did really help me um, throughout college and now that I'm in graduate school. Um, I think I feel very recently, especially, I feel very light um, and very carefree a lot of the time, not only because I do the meditation exercises that help me relieve stress, but I think, you know, basing all my decisions and everything that I do in Falun Dafa and what it teaches me has really helped me, you know, relieve myself a lot of these, you know, worries and troubles that I see in a lot of my other friends. Alongside its meditative exercises, Falun Dafa also features a collection of writings that help guide practitioners in their daily lives. Some practitioners said it's helped them make other breakthroughs. Perhaps the biggest lesson I learned from Falun Dafa is to differentiate what is really important versus what is not so important and also what is right from what is wrong. The reason I was attracted to Dafa when I started reading the book, uh, Joan Falun, was that everything made so much sense that I know that's a cliche but I found the answers of many questions that I had all my life. What I realized was that in the kindness and compassion and forbearance it, it gave me the ability to understand life in a much deeper level and become a much better person uh, in my family, uh, at work, uh, everybody who I touched it enabled me to get a much deeper understanding of life and my place in this whole play of the universe. After a year of lockdowns, events celebrating Falun Dafa Day aim to spread hope for the future. World Falun Dafa Day officially takes place on May 13th. Don Tran, NTD News. An overnight fire destroyed three barns in Maryland, causing over $2 million in damage. A barn in Upper Montgomery County in Maryland caught fire around 11.45 p.m. Monday. Officials say the fire happened in a non-hydrant area. Now we are still on scene of a large barn fire up in uh, Barnesville, Maryland. Uh, 500 by 100 foot barn. Uh, shortly uh, before midnight, crews responded, uh, found a heavy volume of fire. Uh, engulfing the entire barn from one end to the other. The fire spread to two more large barns and raised all three to the ground. Tractors, mowers and farm equipment all destroyed. Total loss reportedly exceeds $2 million in damage. 65 firefighters responded. Officials say there were no animals inside, but there were many bales of hay. The cause of the fire is under investigation. California's governor announced his $12 billion plan to tackle homelessness. His office says it's the largest investment of its kind in California's history. We hear more from NTD's David Lamb. Governor Gavin Newsom announced his plan to end family homelessness. It's part of his $100 billion California comeback plan. What we're proposing here today is a $12 billion two-year housing proposal. Unprecedented again in American history, not just California history. This is not just doubling down on strategies that we know work. This is an order of magnitude. The investment would house 65,000 people in 46,000 new units. He previously launched several similar projects that use federal funding to transform hotels and motels into shelters for the homeless. The San Diego mayor says more than 177 formerly homeless San Diegoans were living in the transformed hotel the conference was held at. But a former supervisor for San Francisco says the money doesn't go to the homeless, but rather selected nonprofit homeless service providers. He says the money would need to be audited to properly track where it goes. Will it solve the homeless problem? No. This is only going to provide shelter for a certain number of home, homeless people. It's not mm. going to address the root causes of homelessness. Hall believes the plan is a blanket approach. If anything, it incentivizes homelessness. Because mm. now you can get a shelter and still be on the street begging for money. It reportedly cost nearly $150,000 to transform housing for the homeless. David Lamb, NTD News, California. Seniors in San Francisco's public high schools are given the green light to go back to classrooms for in-person learning. But some say the move is a money grab. NTD's Eileen Ang has more on the story. Graduation is about three weeks away, and San Francisco's public high school seniors can now go back to in-person learning. But here's the kicker. It's just for one day. 
The San Francisco Teachers Union announced that seniors have the choice to take classes on campus starting Friday, May 14th, the last day of instruction. But some are criticizing the school's decision to reopen their halls now. May 14th is also one day before the deadline to receive California's $2 billion grant for reopening classrooms. On top of that, San Francisco has some of the lowest COVID-19 cases. Susan Solomon, the president of United Educators of San Francisco, told ABC7 that the decision wasn't made earlier because they were busy finalizing the agreements with employees. But the interim executive director of Parents for Public Schools of San Francisco believes money was a motivation. The San Francisco Chronicle reports if students choose to go back, they'll have two staff members supervising them on activities like end-of-high-school conversations or college and career exploration. Only two high school campuses will reportedly be available, meaning most students who do choose to return won't even be at their own school. There are about 4,000 high school seniors in the city, and it's not clear how many will take up this offer yet. Graduation ceremonies will be held outdoors. Eileen Ang, NTD News, California. Coming up, a leopard is still roaming about Chinese villages after escaping from a zoo. A total of three leopards ran away from the zoo last month. And a boy in Shanghai Disneyland punched an employee dressed as Winnie the Pooh. But Chinese media are avoiding the name Winnie the Pooh in their reports and are instead calling him by another name. More soon on NTD News. Ninety percent of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The mission of the Epic Times is to chase the truth, to ground all statements and facts, and prevent people from being misled. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit. Subscribe today and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. In uncertain times, people rush to buy physical gold and silver. It's strong, solid, dependable. Now is the time to buy from the trusted source, Westminster Mint. With 20 years experience and A-plus BBB rating and our unconditional 30-day money-back guarantee, Westminster Mint is America's dealer. The best value in gold coins today is this newly released 2021 $50 American Gold Eagle coin, certified a perfect 70 by the world's largest grading service, NGC. At one full ounce of pure gold, this 2021 Gold Eagle is the biggest and most beautiful coin struck for circulation. Get yours now while you can at our exclusive low price. Call right now and get the Gold Eagle's perfect companion, the 2021 Silver Eagle, absolutely free with your purchase. With free shipping and a 30-day money-back guarantee, Westminster Mint is America's dealer. Hurry for your early release 2021 American Gold Eagle and free Silver Eagle before they're gone. Call now. Three leopards escaped from a Chinese zoo, and one of them is still at large. But the zoo didn't announce their escape until after people had spotted the big cats. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has more. Three leopards have escaped from a zoo in eastern China. One of them is still at large. Chinese state-owned media CCTV reported on Monday that the big cat is wandering in nearby villages. The three leopards fled from the Hangzhou Safari Park on April 19th. But the zoo did not confirm their escape until two weeks later. That's after nearby villagers called the police after spotting cat-like animals. Local media say the zoo has come under fire for delaying the news about the escape. By last Saturday, authorities already captured two of the leopards. The zoo anesthetized and caught the first leopard three days after the escape. Seventeen days later, a search team of 4,000 people caught the second one. The third leopard is somehow a lot harder to get. 
Multiple teams are trying to find traces of the big cat in the surrounding mountains. They used thermal imaging, but were still unable to locate the animal. Later, they used live chicken as baits, installed infrared camera monitors, and are watching the surroundings day and night. At the same time, they also released search dogs equipped with GPS. The search for the third leopard is still ongoing. Local authorities have asked residents to stay alert. And the zoo remains closed. State-run news agency Xinhua reported that police have detained several zoo employees and have launched an investigation into the incident. Winnie the Pooh trended on Chinese social media. A Pooh-related topic got over 100 million views on Chinese social media platform Weibo alone. But the news soon disappeared from the list of trending topics, and the page could not be displayed. Related comment sections have also been shut down. The Chinese regime considers the Disney bear a sensitive figure. That's because many Chinese netizens use him as a euphemism for CCP leader Xi Jinping. The trend on social media started with a boy in Shanghai Disneyland. He recently punched an employee dressed as Winnie the Pooh. Many Chinese media reported on it, but all of them avoided referring to the bear as Winnie the Pooh. Instead, they used the puff bear. Winnie the Pooh has been one of the sensitive words in China since 2013. Chinese netizens compared photos of Xi and then U.S. President Obama walking side by side to Winnie the Pooh and his friend Tigger. The Chinese regime not only censors the name Winnie the Pooh, but also bans his photos from all Chinese social media. Beijing also blocked the 2013 Disney live-action film Christopher Robin featuring Winnie the Pooh. Chinese authorities did not explain why. U.S.-based former media professional Li Maozhen revealed that he used Pooh as his profile picture on Chinese social media. But his friends said they couldn't see his profile picture. Li previously told NTD when he worked for Chinese media, the CCP's propaganda department would issue bans every day. He had to filter all the news before publishing. If a media outlet posted an article that didn't meet the regime's requirements, authorities would remove the article or even shut down the website. And in France, military personnel warn about the threat of civil war. This is not the first time they've raised the alarm. Find out more here on NTD News. Following a wave of violence that hit France over the past week, the military is warning leaders of a civil war. NTD's David Vives has that story. France is facing threats of a civil war. In an open letter published on Monday, military personnel are warning leaders to act to prevent this from happening. But the authors of the letter stayed anonymous. This follows another open letter published in mid-April by 20 generals, including Emmanuel de Richoult. The letter advocates for a return to patriotism, but also warns of a civil war. Civil war means citizens are fighting one another with weapons. What do you call that? For me, we're already in a war. France has been seeing an increase in violence in the last weeks. Civil war is brewing in France, and you are perfectly aware of it, military personnel wrote. Best-selling author Michel Onfray echoed similar sentiments. There is a terrible, incredible violence in France. Not a day goes by without someone being killed or stabbed. It seems politicians don't want to see it. The violence goes up, 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 and an explosion is possible at some point. The French Minister of the Armed Force, Florence Pauly, said she wanted sanctions against the 20 generals who signed the letter they could have their titles revoked. The minister said the new letter seems to be political manipulation. Onfray says the French government isn't listening to the warning in the letter. The government could just listen to the military personnel and validate them. But the generals are accused. It's the situation where the government tries to kill the messenger because they don't want to hear what's happening. They want to shut them down. The letter has been signed by nearly 250,000 people online since it was published two days ago. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. The UK government's shopping list of laws for the next year is put before Parliament. With the pandemic receding, the focus now is on levelling up the country. Every year, the Queen's speech lays out the government's list of bills for the year. Last year, it was cancelled as the government wrestled with the first wave of the pandemic. Now, it's back. 
my Lords and Members of the House of Commons. My Government's priority is to deliver a national recovery from the pandemic that makes the United Kingdom stronger, healthier and more prosperous than before. To achieve this, my Government will level up opportunities across all parts of the United Kingdom. The Queen's speech includes bills for reforming post-16 education, reducing asylum seekers crossing the Channel and plans to ramp up house building. Prime Minister Boris Johnson said that the plans were for unleashing our nation's full potential. My government will strengthen and renew democracy and the constitution. Legislation will be introduced to ensure the integrity of elections, protect freedom of speech and restore the balance of power between the executive, legislature and the courts. The government also unveiled plans to scrap the Fixed-Term Parliament Act. That means that the government will be able to call early elections once again. In total, the Queen's speech laid out 30 bills. A couple in South London celebrate a remarkable year in building their own grocery business from scratch. Since the first lockdown last year, they've been working flat out to bring their dreams to reality. NTD's Neil Woodrow brings us their story. Life partners Emma Salisbury and Lee Daly are also now partners in a business venture, the Magnificent Marrow. Both successful in the floral industry, Emma was due to have a floral installation for her first big celebrity wedding overseas. But then, within a week and a half... Both of them saw their regular jobs disappear as the first lockdown happened early in 2020. Then they decided to form a business together selling fresh produce. They haven't looked back. Lee talks about why they decided to start Magnificent Marrow. To help people that were struggling to get food um, due to the first lockdown. Um, and it was a sort of um, a success right from the start, really. Initially, they worked from the back of a van doing 100 local deliveries a day during the lockdown. They soon needed a unit to work from and acquired one in Rains Park where they live. They started offering nationwide courier deliveries and after a few months opened the unit to customers on a Saturday. Um, we were getting up to sort of 100 people coming up and um, so we decided to sort of find a, a local store. Emma had previously built up 10,000 followers from the wedding world on Instagram and used them to help promote the business, plus some special friends. All of the um, celebrities I'd worked with in the past, I was like, please, can you share this new business? And they did, and it was incredible. Starting a business in lockdown wasn't easy. They couldn't get hold of printer ink, so Emma was handwriting delivery notes at midnight every night. As novice grosses, it's also been a steep learning curve. Uh, this is quite enjoyable for other people, not myself, but understanding little things like potatoes and standing there in front of everybody at the market and they're asking me what size and I'm just like... <laughs> <laughs> that size? I have no idea. In the early days, they were also doing the deliveries themselves. Although they've moved on, life hasn't got any easier. They get up at 1am, go to the market to buy produce for online orders, then back to the unit to pack the London delivery boxes to be collected at 6am. Then it's off to the shop. With our team, set up the shop, go home, have two hours sleep, get back up, and I'll then start on the wedding side of things. Emma's wedding floral bookings are coming back, so while she works on those, Lee is working at the shop. And then we will put the orders in for the shop about six o'clock while Lee is thankfully cooking our dinner, and then we crash about eight o'clock, half eight, and do it all over again the next day. Six days a week. <laughs> They try to put customer service at the heart of the business. Everyone that orders from us, everyone that emails us, everyone that gets in contact with us via Instagram or Facebook, it's just, it's so important to us. And yeah, every we give single a personal response. Yeah. Making strong connections with people helps them too. Someone, when you make a mistake personally, it's hard to get over when you're so tired, but then you've got these amazing bits of these connections that we've made yeah. it just makes everything so much better 
They've now gone beyond their fruit and veg range to offer products from London-based artisan suppliers, including meat, bread, cakes and cheese. Gift hampers are also available. They are supported by a dozen staff who Emma says have their backs, and without them they wouldn't have been able to achieve what they have. Going forward, Emma plans to continue with her wedding floral business as well as joining Lee to create more stores and expand the magnificent Marrow grocery business. The number of regulars here is growing and the range is too. When it comes to fruit and veg, they know their onions. Neil Woodrow, NTD News, Rains Park, London. And coming up, one of the first evening concerts in Rome as lockdown restrictions ease. A magical twist gave the audience an unforgettable night. And rescuers put down a stranded whale calf. The calf was injured and without its mother, it wasn't able to make its way to the ocean despite help. All that and more here on NTD News. It's just clear as day. The media, whether it's broadcast, cable, or print media, has become extremely biased. And I started looking online for alternative ways to, to get information. And I saw an ad for a free trial. And I looked at it and I said, Epoch Times? I mean, come on, this is end of days type of stuff? I mean, what are they gonna be talking about here? And I said, well, it's a free trial, let me dig in. Is it giving me both sides? Is it giving me an objective point of view here? I have looked for opportunities to see where they might be biased, and I don't find it. It has given me a level of trust in media that I didn't think I'd ever get back. I love the Epic Times because it has renewed uh, my faith in the idea that a reliable, responsible, non-biased source of information is available. And I can say that I love it because of that. After months of strict lockdowns, one of Italy's first evening concerts, complete with thousands of candles. NTD Sapphire Quarter takes us to a magical scene. Rome one of the most instrumental places for the formation of Western civilization. Gone is the majesty of the Roman Empire, but when the greatest fruits of Western culture, like Chopin's Nocturne Opus 9, number two, are brought to it, perhaps it is reminded of its past greatness. It's one of the first evening concerts since last fall, when strict lockdowns were enacted. They're slowly being lifted. Thousands of candles flickering in time to their own melody were added to make the scene more magical. Even before the show, the pianist knew the wonder he was about to create. This scenario couldn't have been more inspiring. I still can't believe it. I really feel very excited. I really believe in sharing with others. Socially distancing in Appine Archaeological Park, they waited for the one-hour event to begin. This evening means we can actually attend a concert, even though there's still a 10 p.m. curfew, and we can go out again, and we're so happy about it. I share this opinion. We needed a night like this after so much lockdown. Italy slowly easing pandemic restrictions, with many businesses now partially open. More concerts are scheduled to come, and with them, more chances to taste the majesty of the past. Sapphire Quarter, NTD News. A beached whale had to be put down in the UK on Monday. Rescuers did all they could to return it to the wild, but ultimately decided to put it down in the whale's best interest. Take a look. A whale calf which got stranded in London's River Thames was put down on Monday after its condition deteriorated and the hopes for its survival faded. The mink whale was first spotted on Sunday night at Richmond Lock in southwest London, where it became beached on concrete. Rescuers worked for hours to refloat it and then towed it a mile downstream. They hoped it would make its way to the ocean, but it was later spotted by Reuters, swimming several miles upstream. When it became stuck again, rescuers decided the best thing to do would be to end its suffering and put it to sleep. The size of the whale, estimated at around 15 feet, suggested that it was still maternally dependent. There was no sign of its mother and it was in poor nutritional health. It's very rare for whales to come into the River Thames, 
the Port Authority says the calf would have come from the North Sea, the divide between Great Britain and Norway. A special diamond is soon going under the auction hammer. It's part of a jewellery sale in Geneva later this month. Weighing over 100 carats, the stone is estimated to sell for almost $20 million. Giant, flawless, almost perfect. This is the Alrosa Spectacle, a type 2A diamond to be auctioned in a Geneva jewellery sale this Wednesday. It's the largest ever cut gemstone in Russia. This fantastic 100 carat uh, decolored diamond was cut from a rough that weighed more than 200 carat. It was called the Sergei Diaghilev, the Sergei Diaghilev uh, rough diamond, and it was mined in 2016. According to a specialist from Christie's Auction House, it took one year and eight months to cut into this perfect stone. This item is one of nearly 150 lots on offer in the sale. The specialist says although the pool of buyers for such a significant item is not as large as for many smaller value jewels, she's still optimistic. Um, we have noticed in this uh, COVID time since 2019 that actually uh, buyers were interested in these kind of high uh, jewelry, uh, high jewels, and so we are confident that this will be a fantastic sale. The diamond is expected to fetch between 12 and 18 million Swiss francs, an estimated $20 million. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.